hello what's happening rockers i've got two cups of coffee in front of me i just made another one just in case my good coffee i made a backup in case my good coffee goes south that's always a mistake though it's hard to go from good coffee to bad coffee I'm like, Oof, i'd rather not just like it's hard to go like uh you ever have like good single malt scotch and then you try and switch to a blend like you know just to even something decent mccallan or something and then you you try and have some doers mm. it's not good got fluffy head today uh what's happening i'm in rochester new york i got uh up this morning and our drummer had texted our group chat and uh, with a picture of uh him and uh, kenny aronoff in the elevator i thought kenny aronoff what's he doing here of our hotel and I, th I thought what's he doing here i thought he must be here with satriani and vi and sure enough they're playing here tonight so i immediately bought a ticket because the 14 year old me would be so stoked to be in the same town and you know it's a day off and i probably should be resting my ears and stuff and not uh going to a show but screw that i'm gonna go to a show i'm gonna go see satriani and vi tonight it's gonna be fun so if anybody's in rochester and they're going i'll see you there uh yeah 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 uh ian says uh, so ian you saw the show i hope you enjoyed it uh you saw it in uh, last night in reading of course and we met for a minute um nice to finally put face to the name uh sleep on the bus okay man the bus ride last night so we're on this euro bus which is like a double decker you know the, the, you sleep upstairs and i'm gonna tell you it is crazy on american roads that bus or something about the center of gravity and being up so high and uh on the roads here that it, especially in the northeast and stuff where you know the winter and the temperature fluctuations and it is a little crazy and last night was like literally it felt like i was inside a jar just getting shook by somebody <laughs> like throwing up and down it was violent to the point where i sleep pretty great on the bus but last night uh, it was like oh my god like it was like how would you sleep it's just impossible um and then eventually it chills out you know it's like probably an hour outside of rochester it got good just smooth interstate nice and i was like what was happening like it's the roughest ride that i can remember last night um so a little bonkers but i just ended up sleeping in super late it, it's weird I, I i tend to wake up when it's like that and then i can't get back to sleep for a couple three hours and so that could be at four five six seven in the morning and then at eight, I might fall back asleep or nine. And then I just sleep till noon or something because you got to get at least six or seven hours total, right? So a little bit bonkers, but um, the shows have been awesome. Last night was really fun. Not as big of a crowd last night, but small, small but mighty. And um, they were having a really good time. Two nights ago in Hampton Beach was just stellar it was uh, one of the best shows i think we've ever done it was packed basically sold out uh, at the old hampton beach casino ballroom there for anybody that's been to that venue it's a legendary old venue it's been there forever and uh, it was so much fun because it's like a big club it looks like a big roadhouse that place it's all floor seat seating but it goes way wide on either side of the stage there's a lot of people sitting to the left a lot of people sitting way out to the right and it's just a fun vibe in there uh i put a picture up of it on my ig but it's it was packed it was great so much fun yeah ian says uh it was a lot of fun they're all such great players thanks ian appreciate that thanks for coming good times good times oh my goodness my goodness my goodness what are you guys talking about let's see uh peach right across the lake says ben that's true yeah that's true double fisting coffee says my knees hurt yeah maybe a little I, I probably should take it easy and not even have the second one because i think this was a four shotter i don't want to like send my heart into some sort of arrest oh yeah 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 uh let's see let's see i think i got a sneeze because i got allergies oh <coughs> excuse me uh chris says michael nielsen uh just uh warmed up the crowd for i saw he was doing a little live stream today i did see that when i uh, signed on to youtube 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff says he's going to be there tonight. That's awesome. Yeah, it should be a fun show. Looking forward to it. And Tom's talking about the King Crimson tour that uh, that Mr. Steve Bai is part of. That should be awesome. I love those records. I love Discipline, especially. That was uh, um, such a cool album with uh, Frame by Frame and Mate Kudasai are two of my favorite tracks from that era. So great. Beautiful guitar playing and songwriting. Uh, will you be going to Phil X's show in NoHo to kick off his wife's catering business? You know, I saw that and I was invited, but I'm not in town, I don't think. Um, when is it? It's soon, right? Because I remember seeing it going, oh, I'm going to be gone still. So I'm out here for a little bit still. Uh, do you get to go backstage? You know, I, I, I could put in the effort to do that, but I don't, I generally don't do that or i'm just like that not if i'm invited and i'm with somebody and like whatever then it's but like this morning and just last minute i saw it i was like oh i'd love to go to that and i went on StubHub and bought a, a seat you know i don't know i don't want to be like uh imposing i guess you know so i'm always shy about that uh i might send a couple messages and just put feelers out or whatever but um i've met steve numerous times he did steve did a nice video on he was a part of the uh uh video that i did for his marshal of course the and he allowed me to interview him for that which was awesome so that's on my channel um we had a great talk i guess that's probably the last time i would have spoken with him maybe not actually i got together with him to do something at his request, uh, that was just like a, he had a technical question about something. So he had me over to his studio to ask me something and, uh, walking through something once. So that was the last time I saw him, I think, which was a couple of years ago now. And then Joe, I've had a little bit of interaction with talking guitars and stuff, just on DMs and stuff. Um, um, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, and I met him over the years. I remember meeting him with Cornell back in 2009 at a uh, chicken foot show we were both on the same bill in austria at a festival that's the one where I've, I've told my sammy hagar story before where he met chris and all that so uh do you think about that 55 les paul this is a guitar that i saw on the road a little while ago i was thinking about maybe i should have uh a little bit yeah i who knows? I haven't actually contacted them to see if it's still around. So we'll see. I'm, I'm letting it sit for a minute. I found two things on the road, a 55 Les Paul and a cat that I really liked. So, ooh, check this out. I got Toby on my shirt. How about that? Come on now. <laughs> this is my favorite shirt now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, years ago, I tabbed out your Sinvertech demo. Oh, well, that's cool. I've done a lot of videos for those guys. He keeps making, he sent me another one to me recently, like the, what's it called? The, not the N5, but the, whatever one, you know, is his amp mod pedal that he keeps refining and stuff. I, I really want to talk to him actually about making that into something that's a little more, he keeps doing it in a pedal housing that's, you know, phase 90 size. And it's like, there's so much packed into this pedal as far as voicing switches and stuff. This is a fellow over in, uh, in, uh, uh, in China that is really talented pedal builder and he makes these preamp pedals for those that don't know what I'm talking about Sinvertech CKK it's the same company CKK and Sinvertech and he's got this pedal that's like it's a pretty great Marshall style preamp in a pedal um, that kind of even voice like a JTM 45 or like a Plexi or more like a uh, JCM 800 that kind of thing and um, I'm like you should just put this in a rack or like maybe a big pedal the size of, you know, say something like Friedman's, uh, uh, um, what's it called? The IRX or something. So it's just bigger, you know, so that it's easier to get at everything and stuff. Cause it's a little crazy. Like it's a little like, you know, that it's, it's one of the nuttiest pedals as far as the amount of knobs and switches packed into a very, very small format, but it does sound good. So anyway, that's Invertech. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Stephen Joe are super nice guys. Yeah, and my experience meeting both of them are very kind. So, yeah, that's a couple great. Um, you know, Steve over the years I've had more interaction with, but he, uh, some really really good talks with him. And uh, there's one in particular, you know, that I'll say about Steve that I've probably mentioned it be before, but there was a friend of mine that. Uh, right after Chris Cornell passed away, convinced me to go out that weekend because that was on like a Wednesday or Thursday or something when that awful day happened. And on Friday or Saturday night, Steve was playing at the Malibu Guitar Festival, sitting in, I think, um, and some friends were going to be there and stuff. And so this friend of mine convinced me to go out and I didn't really feel like going out, but I did. I went out and um, after the show, my friend directed me over to Steve and said, Steve wants to chat with you for a second. And I sat down in a booth with him and it was a little noisy in the club still because they were playing music. So he's like, he was so sweet. He like told me a few things that were so, uh, he just wanted to talk to me about Chris basically and saying, you know, that, you know, you're in shock right now and you're in a period of grief, but it's, you'll get through it. And that, you know, there's going to come a time where it's all going to be fond memories and stuff like that. And he just kind of walked me through. It was like the, one of the kindest things. And he didn't have to do that. And it was like he he knew I was going to be there. And he made a point to tell this mutual friend to have me come over and sit. And he just wanted to speak with me for a couple of minutes. I'll never forget that. You know, it was one of the coolest things outside of music. And then so, you know, you forget maybe when you're having that conversation, like this guy was a very big influence on me growing up. And then you think about it later and go, that was the same Steve Vai that you used to listen to when you were 13 or 14 years old and just blew your mind and uh, sort of helped change the trajectory of your life, you know? And you just had this personal kind of conversation. It was so, uh, it really made a big impact on me, you know? Um, but maybe you can tell he's that kind of guy too. He's very, he's very much like he is in interviews and in, uh, you know, some of the, when he gets deep and, you know, it's just, He's, he's a he's a hell of a guy. He's a really amazing human being. So I think, you know, so uh, that's that story. But yeah, so that's why maybe tonight, you know, when I saw immediately, I was like, go buy a seat. Let's go. <laughs> you know, even beyond guitar playing and music and stuff is more more than that, you know. So, I mean, we really I mean, this has been like when I started listening to him, I guess it probably be Zappa ship too late to save a drowning witch probably would have been and then flexible. Because he was on that record, that Zappa record, right? Um, that would have been the first time I ever heard him, I think, because I got that record. And then Flexible, not long after that, and the Attitude song and stuff. I, I, I mean, this is my youth, you know. I remember hearing it right when it came out. Um, and then the Flexi Disc in Guitar Player magazine for uh, blue, that had blue powder on it, you know, which was like a Carbon X100B amp demo, <laughs> and that was maybe. The very I credit with that as being the first gear demo I think I ever saw. It was in the form of a, you know a disc inside a guitar player magazine that you could actually rip out and put on your turntable. It was like very you know interesting how it, how they did it, and it was this, it, it was still one of my favorite Steve Vai tracks was that track. Maybe that's part of why I ended up thinking well when you do these gear demos do it as a piece of music. I never really thought about that, but maybe that's. A part of it was Steve's influence on like, well, he did it in a song that was really musical and that was captivating and I thought it sounded great. So that made me like want to know more about the amp, you know, anyways, there's some full circle stuff for you right there. Kathy says, uh, gigs look like they're going so well. Love seeing all the photos and videos. Yeah, uh, it's been going so great. You know, I can't believe the turnouts actually. And American audiences are crazy. They're like quite energetic it's really cool so it definitely feels like uh you know we got a little vibe going so it's pretty fun i mean we're just we're a band of friends playing great you know classic rock songs that's all it is you know but if you want to come out and see people having a lot of fun with great sound and lights doing that kind of thing it's a great show to go see uh uh, <clears throat> Arthur, what's up? Uh, Arthur says, I watched your demo video again on the Jubilee pedal. Damn, I forgot how beautifully brutal that thing sounds. Yeah, that is a good pedal. I, what was the company that made it? I'm forgetting right now, but I remember the pedal that you're talking about. I just can't. 
remember the name of the manufacturer, but anyways, nice pedal for sure. And one of the only ones I've ever seen based on a Jubilee. Uh, Farid said, did Matthew pick up his Pete Thorne signature yet? Well, the guitar is still being built. It's about a month or two away, I think, from actually being finished. So, But I believe the, uh, that the folks at Guitar Guitar have reached out and made the effort. So I'll find out more about that maybe next week uh, to, to track him down. I'm sure he probably knows already. Uh, I definitely want to have a chat with him once once that all is squared away for sure. Just kind of connect with him. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. You've recently spoken about your early endorsement experience with Gibson. I'd love to hear the story of how your relationship with Sir developed. Oh, well, um, yeah. So around 2005, I bought my first sir and i bought it off an ad on the gear page um and it was a classic it was the blue one that you see in uh the how to play eruption video that guitar that was my very first sir and still the only one i had at that point i think and uh i bought it and it was just such a lovely guitar i've told the story before so tell it like the long version i'll tell the short version the guitar was shipped to me across the country came from the east coast i opened the case pulled it out started playing it i thought Ooh, this feels good and it looked great you know it was in terrific shape i was playing it and it was in tune i realized about 45 minutes later i still hadn't plugged it in i was just sitting there playing it unplugged but i was like wait a minute this guitar is in tune i never tuned it and i've been playing it for 45 minutes and it's still in tune I was like, this is a really quality, good guitar. And that was my first, you know, just it felt right, right out of the case, played great in tune out of the case, stayed in tune. That was a good sign. Uh, so I realized that the company was, you know, in California. I was well aware of John Sir and um, had been following him for a long time. I remember seeing articles and stuff and hearing about him in guitar magazines all the way back into the 80s, building guitars or the Pensacers for Knopfler and Peter Frampton and um, doing work for all kinds of New York folks and stuff. And, um, and I'd heard about his amplifier mods and knew he was part of custom audio and all that stuff too. So um, ended up contacting the company and they invited me to come out and uh, see the factory, meet everybody and stuff. And I did that and we could just kind of hit it off right away. And John just had this like real, I, I have a real uh, penchant for, quality i like nice things that work well and um that are you know well designed and just good tools i like that kind of stuff so he uh he was definitely a great guy to hook up with when it comes to you know making terrific guitars terrific products that are engineered you know impeccably and kind of with all the problems worked out to make your life easier so as a player so we just hit it off and then we just became friends because he's like that if he if John, you know, he's a very kind guy. And if he likes you and if he, uh, you know, he's a very family oriented guy and just, you know, we liked a lot of the same guitar players and music and same era. And we just had a similar um, taste and tone and stuff like that and the things that we liked. And so just natural friendship and um, just started working closer and closer with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So middle pickup said that's amazing i don't think i've heard that story before the story about steve at the festival yeah it was really cool man i mean uh really fantastic it really made me feel better to, to be honest so you know very very nice of him to do that you know and be that considerate yeah uh let's see uh, Chris says Johnny Marr is like that as well, more than just a musician. I've heard nothing but great stuff about Johnny, and I really like watching him in interviews. And um, Henry, our keyboard player, has been recently working with him a little bit, so I hope to get the chance to meet him at some point and, and chat with him while I'm in England. Henry uh, is a string arranger as well as being an impeccable keyboard player, a great musician, and, and so he recently did string arrangements for orchestra for these shows that Johnny did in Manchester and... Uh, uh so he's a part of the camp now um would love i'd love to to meet john he's a different kind of guitar hero you know but he's so musical and uh you know i love his sounds and just his his whole 
it sounds parts the whole package you know really cool uh so many folks have uh seen the show or in the chat that's awesome matt alexander incredible show in wallingford thanks and great to meet you nice to meet you nice to meet everybody that's come out to the gigs so awesome um, did you get a chance to visit House of Guitars? You know what? Uh, that's where James is right now. He's off, and I instead I'm here with you. <laughs> so I've still got tomorrow morning. I could probably make my way over there, uh, which I may do. I'm gonna actually wait for him to kind of report back and let me know if he thinks I would I would like it because uh, he likes to go. And then if he sees something, he buys a lot of guitars and vintage stuff, and so he'll go and then he'll see something and then he'll mull it for a day and then. He go back so maybe he'll be going back in the morning if he sees something he wants to go back and check out again uh but uh yeah i've chosen to i filled the day with uh, uh probably just tracking down food sunday live and then also uh going to the vi and satrani show tonight yeah todd says john makes great pizza too he does uh makes a hell of a pizza gluten-free he's got that down solid He's got a, he's a, John does it everything kind of the same. If he does it, he does it 300%. So he's got the proper pizza oven and he's worked on his dough recipe for years now and perfected it. And, uh, you know, the, the oven has to be just the right temperature and the pizza's got to go in for just the right amount of time and the whole night he's got it all. It's very, he gets on forums just like we do our guitar forums. There's pizza forums. <laughs> I'm not making this up and uh argues with people just like guitar players do about uh, pizza dough and uh, things like that it's all the same it's human nature all right johnny says he got a, a friedman uh jakey lee 20. awesome nice little amp for sure it's excellent yeah uh middle pickup says with all the SHIT going on in the world right now. It's nice hearing a story, reigniting a little faith in humanity. Yeah, that's part of why I'm going to the show tonight, too. Just um, there is a lot of crap going on in the world right now. It's such a, a difficult time, um, really. But music is really that's what I see at our shows is, you know, makes people happy. That's our job, essentially, right? As is to kind of give people a little escape, take them on a little journey, a little ride as musicians. And that's what I want to go do tonight. I'm like, I thought about it for about five seconds when I heard that they were going to be here. Should I go? Should I not? Should I just take it easy tonight? And I was like, no, the 14 year old in you would be like, you idiot. If the 14 year old in you even heard you saying that in your mind. So go to the show. It's by and Satriani. <laughs> Big part of my, you know, who I ended up being. So, um, what, you know, I got to go. So reliving my, my youth a little bit and, and remember, and also I need to get a little, uh, uh inspiration and stuff for instrumental guitar um uh, you know what i mean like just get a little spark again for why i do what i do and stuff like that because i want to do some recording this year and stuff and uh I, I think it'll be an inspiring show uh do you know the people at js technologies i do 100 percent. that's what we were just talking about john and his pizza recipes no john's one of my best friends honestly uh, we talk all the time, like almost daily. Uh, Tom says, go to, uh, or I think you're saying House of Guitars is really cool. I went to House of Guitars, Tom said, uh, when I was working up there, really cool store. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love, maybe I'll go tomorrow morning. There's no reason why I can't go tomorrow. I don't have sound check till like 4 p.m. tomorrow. So I'll probably go and drop my bags at wherever we're playing and then make my way over there. Sounds like a good plan uh let's see what else have we got here uh, uh currently going through carpal tunnel syndrome have you gone through something like this a little bit um I have had a little bit of that over the years. I find the best thing to do is find a good sports medicine person. I mean, beyond recommending anything, um, any times that I've had problems, I've gone and uh, I, I went to a good sports medicine therapist. And, you know, they'll they'll recommend stretches sometimes and things you can do. 
uh, to kind of warm up your hands and things like that. So I'm going to leave it to the professional, but I would say that's your best bet. Find somebody that does sports medicine, physiotherapy, explain to them what you're going through and stuff, and they'll hopefully be able to recommend a course of either treatment or exercises or things you can do. If ultimately you've got to get uh, a surgery, I do think it's fairly routine these days. I mean, as far as carpal tunnel surgery, I know there's a recovery period, and, but there's different types of carpal tunnel surgery. And you might look into the non-invasive. I know there's one that's basically an outpatient surgery that they can do and send you home the same day, that kind of thing. And it's fairly, I mean, it's literally like a very, very small incision. I'm sure you know all this already, but the carpal tunnels, of course, the where your nerves pass through your wrist right here into your hand and that can area can become if it gets inflamed at all on the wrist or it can uh pinch those nerves and then you got problems so um it's all about kind of releasing the tension in there by uh you know sometimes surgery is a, is a last resort but I, I do think it's fairly successful surgery and fairly simple these days and they seem to have it down so you want to do your research but uh there is hope there is hope first thing i would do is you know, probably your your general practitioner and get a referral to a physio or sports medicine type of clinic and see if they can help you at all and then go from there. Ibuprofen tends to help, uh, I find, you know, um, but it's also hard on your belly and all that. So, uh, yeah. Okay. What else we got here? Let's see. What do you know about the Egnator Tweaker 15? Not that much. I don't really know what they're based on, but I do remember that amp. I mean, it was a kind of a small amp that had, you know, various circuit tweaks that you could make in the front end. Probably things like coupling caps and, you know, brights and things like that that you could switch to kind of change the voicing. So I, do, I remember it, but I don't remember how they sound really. Although Bruce always designed great stuff. I mean, I loved the M4 preamp, the original IE4, uh, and the, the M preamp that sort of was the, I guess, you know, granddaddy to the, what is now Synergy, that concept of a modular preamp. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Todd says he had carpal tunnel and uh, as a drummer, almost had to get the operation until I tried therapy and that worked. Like physiotherapy? Maybe you can recommend where you went, Todd, or or uh, something along those lines, or or kind of what you did. Uh, let's see. I have Duncan Pearly Gates in all my guitars. Any opinion? Uh, I always thought they sounded pretty good, kind of like a, um, you know, sort of one of the first signature pickups that I can remember. You know, the Pearly Gates coming out. They've been out a long, long, long time. I think they were out in the eighties or nineties. Um. Can't remember. Kind of a hot PAF, right? Weren't they? Or maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking of the Screaming Demon at around 10k or something. Pearly Gates. I can't remember the. Uh, I get. You know. I. I don't know. Now, it's been a long time since I've heard one. I wonder how they kind of stack up against the so many pickups out now. You know, the latest offerings. My knee shirt said. Uh, had really bad carpal tunnel issues. Diet change helped a lot. Stretching and physical therapy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big Boss says, strongly recommend stretching your hands, hand yoga before surgery. Yeah, my friend John Button had some great stretches that he would do, you know, back this way, down this way, against a wall, kind of, but not with a lot of pressure, just enough where you feel it stretching and kind of, I can I tend to just kind of stretch my arm when I'm like, you know, because my I get a little bit of like nerve stuff in my hands if I first sit down and I try and play and I'm totally cold, and if I just do a little bit of like, because I think I get it in here, I think this is where my main problems are. I can just kind of tell like, uh, they call it golfer's elbow, you know, the inside of your elbow, not the outside, which is a tennis elbow. But I think I get nerve kind of stuff uh, stemming from there. And the interesting thing is for me, the more my hands kind of warm up, and if I just warm up slow, it goes away. So that that's kind of cool. I get blood flow going, and I don't seem to have uh, lingering problems too much. So, yeah. Uh, sports medicine helped Todd. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, there's a super chat from QStick333. Interested in the Strymon Brig for the multifunction. By the time I add a favorite switch, I'm close to the price of the timeline. Uh, I've never really done that side by side comparison to see how close the you know D bucket or whatever algorithm is to um, to the you know the two the brig and the and and also there's a new version of the brig. So how close is that compared to you know the old one? Um, but you know it's one voicing. That's the only thing you do have the one voicing. You don't want to have a tape voicing or a digital. Um, so if you think you could benefit from, from that, cause there's times where just that analog voice, I mean, it's a lovely sounding delay. It's terrific, you know, but there's going to be times where maybe you might want digital or tape, or you might need a, you know, uh, multi, uh, like a, uh, you know, the two taps or things that you can get on the multi patterns echo, you know, all that business. And so you do get a lot more with the timeline. So I guess it just depends if you're just kind of a one sound person and you need a small pedal board. Um, you mainly want that analog delay. I mean, you got nothing to lose. The, the, the new brig, of course, has uh, memory locations and, you know, you can store presets and stuff like that. So there's no, it's a little more, I don't want to say complicated, but it's it's not quite as easy to probably to just store and direct, you know, you know, your MIDI to it in order to change, but you can do it. And I mean, once you do the work on a brig and store your, your sound, however many presets you want, they're in there and you're probably not going to do a hell of a lot more programming beyond that. At least that's what I always think. I, I sort of program my delays and then uh, if I need to make another preset or tweak beyond that, I, I, I base it off one of my old presets. You know, I've in my EVH SDE 3000, for instance, um, I kind of work off my presets that I made for it because um, I was part of the, you know, came, coming up with the presets for it. And uh, I'll, I'll base my my sounds mainly off those presets of mine, or I'll use one of the EVH presets. But generally, generally, I base it off one of mine. And then if I need to change the delay time a little bit for a certain song or something, or the mix a little bit for a certain song, I'll do that. But I'll take one of those and just copy it over to another memory location, and then um, you know just start up start with my own presets, that kind of thing. So, uh, long story short, that's a lot of extraneous information but I, I i think it just depends on ask yourself how versatile of the delay you need do you need digital do you need tape do you want those options uh do you want it to be a little bit more straightforward to program and, and stuff like that because you know that's the, always the advantage with the bigger pedal is it's a little more straightforward and you can get the things a little easier and the way the layout on the classic strymon pedals is the big ones is, is pretty great like it's very they're very simple to use they're very, i like the you know, they're, they're, they're getting a little dated at this point, probably, but I've still got uh, a Mobius on my pedal board because it just does everything I need. And, you know, we play Spirit of Radio in, in our set. And, um, oh, my God, I started using in-ears a little more uh, on the gig just because I'm enjoying the inner mix that our guy gets going. Uh, and when we play Spirit of Radio, uh, I've got the flange going on the Mobius, and then I've got a chorus going in the... Uh, the h90 and um you know a little bit of echo and stuff like that too on the patch and it sounds so good when i start playing it in my in-ears it's just like super stereo and sounds like the record it's really fun when we kick into the tune uh, uh you know i just start playing and i'm like instantly jazzed on the sound you know and that's partly the the flange and the mobius and the and the, and the chorus and stuff so anyway it's just fun <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Um, do you ever do a sound check and things aren't working right? If so, does this rattle you? A little bit. Um, like sometimes I'll do a sound check and, and something's wrong, be it, you know, I don't know what, like a ground thing or whatever. And, you know, there's things about my rig because it's fairly complicated that my tech won't catch. And I, I, it'll take me getting to sound check and powering up and going, ah, this is wrong. You know, sometimes I'm finding the mics are patched backwards on my amps or something. You know, they've gotten the two cables backwards. So I'll go over and I'll tap one and the left one is coming into my right in ear, or, you know, and that screws me up a little bit um, just because of the, the, you know, I want the image in the back, the left cab to be in my left ear and the right to be in the right. 
Um, little things like that. Um, I had a tube failure of last week. Luckily, not on a gig. It you know amp powered up and blew the the HT fuse. I was pretty proud of myself. I actually did my own diagnosis and uh, and uh, biasing and stuff last week with multimeter and you know I can get inside a PT one hundred now and bias it and you know if I had to do my own tubes on the road stuff. It's pretty cool. I mean, John taught me how to do it. He made me a nice nice video, uh, but. It's interesting if you've got it. So if you've got, uh, this is just a little how I did it. Um, generally speaking, if an HT fuse blows, which there's usually two fuses in amps these days, or often anyways, maybe not usually, but often you'll find there's the mains fuse. If that blows, then the amp just powers down, right? Um, but if you've got no sound and no hiss coming out of the cabinet, that maybe means the HT fuse is blowing. That's the one just for the power tubes, power section. So that's what happened. My amp was blew the HT fuse. So, and that generally means you've got a bad tube, wonky tube, and the HT fuse will blow before you arc a tube. So, I went and found some more fuses because, unfortunately, I thought I had the right ones out here, but I didn't. So I had to go to an electronic store and buy fuses. Went and bought some two amp fuses. Put a new two amp in the amplifier, powered it up, and got inside with the multimeter and as i was shown by john very carefully to not touch any of the stuff that will you know blow your socks off went in and checked all the tubes everything seemed fine and then i heard the fuse blow again so that's kind of good in a way because it's like i figure all right it's not going to be an intermittent problem that's going to be go away for a week and then come back in a week it popped a fuse within the amp being powered up 30 seconds within me powering it up again so that means okay i've got a tube that's because John explained to me that tubes can heal themselves sometimes. And, <laughs> you know, then you're like, well, which one was it, right? And it's a mystery. And then you might as well replace them all. I only had three. I have three tubes, a four tube amp, 100 watt amp, of course. I had three tubes that were all a pretty close match, you know, to the ones that were in the amplifier. So that's not enough to retube the whole amp, obviously. But three tubes that that were rated pretty close. They check, they'll, sometimes out at Sur, they'll measure them for me so that I'll, I'll i'll take a whole set with me that is so so i don't have to rebias and if i blow a tube or something i can red plate or whatever i can just pull them all put in the new ones and they're close enough match within five milliamps or something to what the ones in the amp were that i can just carry on without needing to rebias well they could only find three for one of my amp heads out at sir the last time i was there that were a match so i took the three but that man, I had to kind of, I couldn't just pull them all and retube, had to kind of find where the bad one was and then maybe just replace one of them because I only got three, right? Uh, so I went, at, here's what you do if this is the case. You just pull two tubes, either the outer pair or the inner pair. Because you know you can run a four tube amp on just two tubes, right? You just have to use a, if you're actually going to play it like that, you got to go, uh, go half down on the impedance. So you use the four ohm output instead of an eight ohm if you've got an eight ohm cabinet or an eight ohm if you've got a 16, that kind of thing, right? Pull two tubes and you can go down one impedance, you know, does that make sense? So, uh, but I didn't want to run the amp off two tubes. I wanted to replace two of them, you know? So, so what happens is you pull the two tubes, put a new fuse in because I'd pop the fuse, pull the outside pair is what I did. I replaced with two of the new ones that I, you know, the, that, that I've got out of the three put them in the amp, put a fuse in, two amp fuse, powered it up, let it run for a while. Everything cool. Didn't blow a fuse. Didn't blow a fuse. Still didn't blow a fuse. An hour later, didn't blow a fuse. Let it run for a while. That probably means you found the bad one, right? Because whatever tube was causing the issues, you know, it seemed like I, I popped two fuses pretty quickly with the amp powering up. So, so anyways, um, now I'm good. So then I went through and I measured all the, you know, looking at the the milliamps on every tube. And it was like it's supposed to be around, John likes them around uh, 34, something like that in the PT100. So I went through and I found that with the two that I'd put in the amplifier, um, one was at like 29 or 28. And then the other ones were when I, when I, you know, I raised the bias a little bit and the other ones were up around 38 or something or 37. So now I've got a spread of almost nine or 10 milliamps. That seemed a little wide to me. 
I had like, you know, 33, 34, 38, 29, and that kind of thing. So I was like, okay, let's try and pull this one that's at 29 and replace it with the one more good one that I've got. I put it in the amplifier and checked the bias. Now everything was within about five milliamps. Luckily, the other one was, you know, reading like 33. So now I'm between like 33 and 38 or something. All good. Um, let the amp run a little longer, plugged it into a cabinet, checked it for the next hour or two. Everything's cool. So uh, I put it back in the chassis and I used it the last two nights and everything's been fine. So that was cool. That was cool. So yeah, if, if you've got a tube amp, if you've got a hundred watt and you can afford to do it, when you buy um, tubes, try and get a match set of eight. If you can do that. If you can, I know they're expensive these days, but if you can afford it, you're going to need them probably at some point anyway, unless you decide you're going to sell the amp or something. So if you can get a, might, you know, you might be out, uh, you know, close to a couple hundred bucks, but you're covered, right? Because you can take it to your tech, get it biased. And if they all match up and stuff, you'll have enough if you're on the gig and you need to replace because otherwise, you know, you're going to have to source tubes out on the road and stuff and they're pain in the butt. That's that story. That's that story. Uh, did I miss that super chat or did I get it? I can't remember now. Uh, oh, no, that was the Brig question, right? The super chat. Thank you for that super chat. Appreciate that. And I'm going to move on now after that long-winded dissertation about retubing and issues on the road. I think I see some of you have been talking about Carpal Tunnel in the chat and uh, posting some links. That's great. Good resource here, helping out your fellow musicians with their issues. Recently purchased a JCM 900 and it's a bit fizzy. Any tips for getting rid of the hiss? Well, if there's hiss and you find it seems excessive, it, it, many times it can be traced to a preamp tube that's just kind of noisy. Um, I've found recently, you know, I tend to like big bright caps and amps, my Marshall derived stuff. So like the big, you know, 4,700, Pico Farad or whatever, or 5,000, you know, I like that bright cap, but it does increase hiss in the front end because it's letting all the signal through the, you know, that how those highs and stuff and that's where all the hiss lives. So um, you might want to try some different, you know, try and buy a tube, maybe hit up a, you know, the tube store, or maybe Doug's tubes or something and maybe a little personal help and say, hey, I, I'm really looking for a low gain, uh, sorry, high gain, but low noise tested 12ax7 for the first slot in my amp and you might find that it it um significantly reduces the hiss you know you might just have kind of a noisy tube if it's hiss that you're saying you're, you're also saying fizzy so that's a little bit of a different thing um fizzy i don't know the jcm 900 spec actually but that could be coming from something like a bright cap or something that you don't like so it could could just be a mod situation where you might want to have somebody look at it and just kind of you know warm up the front end a little bit um depending on you know what's in it uh i would i would say it'd be a job for somebody like friedman or something you know if if you want to do that simple voicing thing to just kind of smooth it out a little bit dave has a lot of good tricks for that kind of stuff like JCM 2000s, JCM 900s, certainly JCM 800s, making them, you know, just optimized and a little tighter or a little smoother or a little less, you know, because there's multiple places in an amp where you can change things like how much high end is getting through or what high end is getting through um, and just kind of, you know, help to voice the amplifier to make it optimized for the circuit without doing any major modifications, you know, just small stuff. Yeah. Uh, did I hear correctly? You will be in South Bend, Indiana with CRS. We did play South Bend. It was one of the uh, first gigs on the tour. So we already did that, but it was it was a blast. It was fun. That's where I found a cat that I adore. <laughs> I want to take home. Probably already been adopted. Uh, yeah. Let's see what else we got here. Um... Perlick Gates is Alnico 2 bar. Well, that's interesting. So it's Alnico 2. It's really low. Uh, like, I mean, it's not the whole story, but 7.3K neck and 8.35K bridge probably sounds great. I wonder if they're matched coils. Probably. 
but it sounds like a pretty typical kind of PAF spec. <clears throat> I mean, that's kind of what a Thornbucker is, but with an Alnico 4 in the bridge and an Alnico 5 in the neck. Similar 7.3, 8.4, or something like that, but we use a little different magnets. So I think our bridge pickup would probably be a little, a little hotter, ever so slightly, and just a little more push than, than that. But, <clears throat> you know, it depends on the Les Paul, but that could, you know, in the Les Paul, it could sound great just having a, a, uh, um, that exact setup that you're, you know, I like the real low wine neck pickup because those guitars, they just generate so much, you know, a lot of bass and stuff in the neck position. So a low wind is great in the neck. That's all you need. Um, what factors go into choosing one type of amp over another for a venue or tour? Mm, it really depends on the music and the artist more than the venue anything with a good master volume and I could, I could take a PT 100 or two of them anywhere. Uh, cause the masters are so good that if I had to turn down, I would, but you know, there was a stage recently where we got there and they were like, uh, oh, stage kind of small today. Could you go to one amp? And I was like, no, <laughs> because I've got all my presets configured stereo or a lot of them anyway and stuff. And it's just like too much work, but they just make room, you know, it's just like, even if you got to stack the cabs or if you got to, you know, you can take up less floor space. And it ended up working out fine and stuff, but you, know, you might have to change up your volume or whatever. But I mean, I'm even finding I don't have to do that that much. We're playing fairly loud on stage, but with the screen, we're using the plexi in front of the cabs, like it's, like Bonamassa does. It, it's fine, you know. Haven't had anybody complaining in the front about the guitar volume, so it's definitely cranking. Um, but the the main thing that'll affect the choice of amp is the for me is the uh, the artist, you know. Like if I was to do Don Henley type gig again, I was thinking I might try the Hedgehog, the Sir Hedgehog, because it would be great for his gig. I mean, that kind of smoother, it's a little more dumbly, um, it's a little more American based, you know, and that with an open back cabinet, I think would actually be like the open back Hedgehog cab in that amp, uh, and probably just a couple voicings that are in the amplifier, you know, I mean, you can store up to four, I think with a MIDI recall, but the, the you know, the, when I made a video for the Hedgehog, I did kind of a bright, spanky, clean, a little more pushed, a little more rock, and then a little more rock with the mid boost on and the overdrive and all that um, that you could do in the Hedgehog. And it, that would kind of be all the only sounds I would need for that. So, and I kind of like thinking about stuff like that. Like I enjoy the thought of like, okay, what does this gig require? You know, and like I'm stereo right now, but for something like Don's band, like that 212 hedgehog 50 watt 6l6 I kind of like wish i could get the chance to try that because i think it would sound really nice and mono you know because i learned in don's band mono is better for for that music you know it's nothing stereo going on with the guitars in eagles stuff you know so uh it, it would just work better so anyway um yeah, so it's all about the gig, really. More more about the music than it is the the venue or anything. There's a little consideration. I mean, but I've used PT15 you know, with the band I'm with now that I'm using 200 watt amps with. So, you know, we used to play a little quieter on stage, so that was fine. But now we're really rocking. It seems to be working. Uh, I'm new to Floyd Roses, says HH. Got an EVH Frankie. The neck is straight, but buzzes. Should the Floyd have shims to match the radius of the fretboard? Oh, so, well, um, it really depends. Like if, if the fretted notes are, are buzzing too, and the open notes are buzzing, it's probably just a matter of maybe a little more relief in the neck. Heard somebody outside it sound like somebody I know. I was just wondering. Uh, anyway, sorry. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, loosen the truss rod just a hair to get a little more relief in the neck and see how that feels. But it's a fine line. You know, I mean, with a Floyd, you can only do the the, the posts of the tremolo to kind of raise or lower to, for action. So, you know, to change that a little bit, uh, possibly, you know, you might need to raise it just a little, the posts. 
and and maybe a little like what I would say is try to the, the neck first, just getting a little because you don't want a dead straight neck that'll generally be buzzy down below the seventh fret, maybe the open notes, little bit of relief, just a little. And I mean, like literally like a quarter turn on the truss rod is what I would do, not a half, but just a quarter or even a little less, you know, uh, try doing that and then see if that clears up, you know, and play light and see if there's buzzing if you play hard and if you play light and there's almost no buzzing at all and they play a little harder there's a little buzz i can handle that that's kind of about where i set my guitars because <laughs> i like low action stuff um it, it's very individual you know, some people don't want no buzzing so then you gotta have a little more relief a little higher action but that's the first thing i would do change the neck angle or the neck yeah using the not the angle with the heel but the, the uh you know I did, I think, shim my EVH Frankie guitar. Um, the the it just sort of seemed like it needed it. There's certain guitars where I feel like I can't get the bridge, like you know, because it's a fine line with a Floyd that's flush mounted to the body, and there's no back route. You know, you might be backing it down, kind of almost as far as you can, and then still feel like the action's kind of high up above the twelfth fret. And I don't like that. And that's instantly solved by one little business card shim under the end of the neck. And I think I did that on my Frankie. And that allowed me to get the bridge to just a little bit off the body. It's still, I, I got a trim setter from my Frankie. So it's got one of those things in the back that I had to screw into the body, you know, by the block. So the block backs up against it and, and stops. Um, yeah, I don't know if, you know, if, if you have trouble with it, you might want to take it to a tech that you love and see if you can get it just dialed in perfect. But uh, the, my first kind of clue is when you say the neck is straight but buzzes, it, it, it shouldn't be dead straight. Check the G string, you know, at the first fret and then put, use your pinky on the G string at the 22nd fret. And then use your thumb to tap in the middle around the 12th fret and make sure that it, you can push it down a little bit, you know, that there's a little bit. Of, now it's a straight edge between the first fret and the 22nd. You should have just a little bit of relief where you can tap it on the 12th fret. So that, that means the neck has got a little bit of curvature in it because you've got a little bit of a, you know what I mean? So if the neck is dead straight, you'll hold the string at either end and the, and the string will be lying on the 12th fret, you know? And that's, you, you can't have it like that. It'll definitely buzz down low and the open strings will probably buzz too. So the height of the nut is a very specific you know they do make shims for floyds and it's a it's a you know it's a fine line like you don't want it too high you don't certainly don't want it too low or the open strings will buzz um so if you're finding the guitar basically plays good and there's not a lot of buzzing going on except for the open notes then yeah then that's probably too low and that's unfortunate because then you just, you know you can just get some shims and raise it but they'll make a good you know stuart stuart mcdonald or something buy some floyd shims uh for the the right side, you know, or three or whatever the nut is and pop one under there and put it back on and see if that solves the issue. Uh, okay. Moving down through the chat. How is the newish live rig working out? Great. I mean, any drawbacks? None. I mean, other than it's big and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's just, there's, I, I guess the only drawback is it's fairly complex. So if something were to go wrong, I mean, knock on wood, that it won't, you know. But it's there's a lot of patch points and things like that. But I, I haven't had any problems other than that amp. I, I mentioned, a, you know, popped a, popped a HT fuse on an amp, and that means bad tube. And then I did the work I had to do and fixed it. So it's all good. Uh, speaking of Rush, what are your thoughts on Clockwork Angels? You know, I hadn't listened to it a ton. Um, when it came out, I listened to it, but I don't, I can't, uh, you know, I, right now, if you ask me to pull a song out, I wouldn't be able to. So it's, it's not an album that I'm super familiar with at this point, you know, um, I should go back and give it a listen. Actually, everything kind of post counterparts. I didn't do vapor trails and stuff. I didn't do like a ton of, you know, deep listening at that point. But I guess I should go back and give everything a shot and listen uh, uh, closer. You know, spend a little more time with that and maybe a little less on the classic. <laughs> it's 
So an album that I listened to a little bit recently and got, you know, that if, is uh, Grace Under Pressure, which like I kind of let that one go for a while. But man, there's some good stuff on that record. The tones and stuff is really cool. Love Alex's work on that record. Uh, if you're going to a guitar store, how do you like to try them out? That's a great question. Um, that's interesting. You say SRVs to just pluck the high E string and listen. I do that on acoustics sometime in guitar stores on the low string. You know, I, I'm always on the hunt for an old J50, like, uh, or J45, you know, that doesn't have the the 60s adjustable bridge. I hate those. That's a tone sucker. But the the ones with this a regular bridge on them, I had a 59 and it was just the acoustic sounded like the voice of God, you know, he'd pl pluck the low string and it just went, wow. <laughs> it just had this bloom, you know, some guitars go boom. This one went, wow. <laughs> and I, I attribute a lot of it to the right bridge on that particular model. Um, sort of the simplicity of the design and then also the really scallop bracings in those 50s, you know, I guess 30s, 40s, 50s, Gibsons, they all had it. But the bracing was very scalloped and thin in those guitars. They probably weren't that strong as a thing. But, oh, my God, like the less wood that they would use for bracing, it seemed like. If you look at 90s ones, they've got big round bracings, uh, big round bracings. That's what I'm trying to say. It's like more, the, the bracings are thicker and they kind of sound like it. They sound more dampened to me. And then when you hear the ones with the scallop bracings or you hear custom, you know, kind of high end acoustics, boutique acoustics that have very scallop bracings, I hear a similar voice. So the guitar just kind of just opens up and sounds amazing. And, it, you know, as much as vintage guitars, electric guitars have a, a cool thing going on, I think vintage acoustics can even have more of a obvious like oh my god that guitar sounds like it's a 50 year old you know just incredible sound or 60 year old or whatever um a beautiful voice in the way so i'll do that with just the the low e string sometimes in on, on acoustics you made me think of that with the, the stevie thing but um i like to try them on amplified for sure if it's an, an electric like uh i saw uh at grunes they've got this crazy 66 strat that is a one-off uh, employee build, they think, because it's see-through blonde. Um, very strange for that year. It was a very transitional kind of interesting guitar with a 64 neck and an odd logo on it. It's very rare and interesting. Um, but I saw Tom Buka back there and he was like, you got to try this one, man. Like, check out this guitar. It's really cool. And I, I played it and I was like, this guitar has such a bold, like acoustic voice. You know, you just play it and you realize it's loud and got, you know, the high notes are warm and sing and all that kind of stuff you, uh, unamplified it all starts there to me you know so yeah 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 uh jim cox asking about uh house of guitars i think i'm gonna check that place out tomorrow Everybody's talking about it, so I guess I got to go. But I couldn't go today because I'm here with you guys. So um, and I don't think I'll have time after this. It'll already be 5 p.m. They'll probably be getting ready to close. But I'll have time tomorrow. I can swing over there. Uh, is the video of your current rig still coming? Yeah, I really got to do that. So I have video shot and stuff. And I think I might even all have it on a on a drive. I already did that. But I, I, I need to just make a video i've got a couple of videos that i filmed in the can i just need to edit though to put out like i put out a video the other day from the multi-cab from sackless i'm not sure if you guys saw that it's a cool little uh speaker sim box that'll that hosts digital speaker sim so you can easily get a great mic up sound to the pa or to recording interface and it also has simple preamp and power amp kind of very simple analog voicing in it so if you want to run it on a pedal board uh, you, you could run with, you know, some preamp pedals or overdrives and distortions and get some some pretty cool tones like direct right out of it. So I, I finished that video the other day. And I got a couple more to do. So I, I just I got a little backlog of that stuff to get out. Um, Donner Prince overdrive pedal. I got to get out. Yeah. Uh, Arthur says, I've never done a bias job on an amp. Yeah, it's a little scary at first, but then I was like, oh, this is easy. Once you get in there and do it, it's. It's uh, pretty uh, pretty simple. I'm pretty far back in the chat, so I think I'm going to uh, uh, move down here. Uh, let's 
see. Um, I've been looking at some of the modular synergy stuff, says Mr. Hillis. Uh, notice that everyone seems to love the sound and feel, but not many use them as their live rigs. Um, you know, it's a it's a really good concept. I, I've, I've always thought it's a little bit of a niche sell these days, a rack mount, preamp, power amp. You know, it's, it's bucking the trends a little bit for sure. I mean, I just think that uh, probably you got a lot of guitar players that, you know, the simplicity of a head or a combo or whatever, and then a simple pedal board or even, you know, the modeling stuff is, you know, kind of got a huge part of the market now, you know, people playing that stuff. Um, you know, we, we went the other night and we were in, uh, in, uh, heck was I in Hampton beach and we went out and had a drink afterwards. And there was a bar down the street with a cover band playing. They were pretty darn good. It was like a big stage with, pretty proper lights and stuff, you know, and these guys were up there playing like a bunch of rock and pop hits and stuff. They had a whole pretty good show put together that were worth, you know, going right from song to song to song to song. And the guitar player was playing a Charvel with a, a head rush cabinet on a chair behind him. <laughs> you know, one of those little like head rush monitors. That's what he was monitoring through and it was behind him. I like that, that it was on a chair. It was like probably because it feels more like an amp, you know, behind. And I thought, you know, look at this guy, like here he is, he's doing it and he's got, very, you know, I don't know what he's using a helix or a quad or something on the floor, probably, but Axe effects, you know, who knows? And, uh, or maybe a head rush. And that's one way to go, you know, it's just like with the synergy, you know, you're kind of asking people to, I mean, I, I still, I think they sound really good. It's like, to me, it's something in the studio that, uh, it seems to make a lot of sense because I like the idea that. You know, for instance, I've talked about the angle modules as being some of my favorites because they're a very alternate high gain sound to anything that I have. They've got a, a more, you know, that kind of, you know, angle of the German company. They've got a bit more a, like a metal voice, for lack of a better term. Um, and just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, really easy plug them in, get that, you know, different sound or maybe like the deliverance or something or like these different kinds of modules or the 2C or different kinds of things that I don't have. Um, gigging wise though, you know, I, I use my favorite amp, which is the, the PT, you know, obviously, um, that's my, all my main food group sounds that I need in there. And it's like, you know, so I think a lot of guitar players are probably the simplicity of just a simple paddle board, maybe a deluxe reverb, or maybe for some people it's a dual rectifier, or maybe for some people it's a JCM 800 with a few pedals and that's all they use. And then everything's kind of contained and maybe it's just the... I don't know. I'm just, I'm just spitballing. Like, what is it about? I guess maybe ask some of the people here, like what they, what would be their hesitation about going synergy or, or, or their reason to go to a synergy, you know, I guess I'll see Vi using his tonight, you know, his module is really cool. I think it's, it's got a really nice sort of smooth lead, warm distortion thing. And then the, the, a very, very spanky kind of hyper fendery scooped clean, uh, that I found, not surprising, but it's like, oh, oh, that's useful. Like, it's almost like, uh, I mean, it's to be and warm, but it can be almost hi-fi sounding too, you know, with its clarity. So, uh, yeah. Okay, let's see here. I've replaced Iberge says I've replaced one tube in a GMP 2203 I bought in 1980. You might want to get it looked at, just have the caps looked at and stuff. Cause they, they say every 10 years, you know, it should be recapped, but maybe not, maybe it's just fine. You know, I mean, caps are probably, it's pretty old man, 30 years. I don't know. Might recommend a recap, but if it works, it works right till they don't, I guess. Uh, recently got a Sur SL68 Mark II, and I can't hear anything when I flip the fat switch. Um, it's not a huge difference. Um, you just mean you can't hear a change, right? Uh, it's a it's a one cap V2 that that basically a little more fat in the front end. Um, you know, get a medium gain voice. If it's super high gain, maybe it's harder to tell. Get a little bit of a, like a medium gain, let a chord ring and then flip it and see if you can, you know, it's pretty subtle though. 
and so is the the gain switch that, that opens up the the eq a little bit and changes the value of the mid pot pretty subtle it's subtle stuff you know just voicing if you had to have a digital rig on the road would you go with kemper well the digital rig i have been using is a quad actually and i and i still am using it and i will use it i've got some gigs with five for fighting next month i'll be back in florida in may playing a couple gigs with them i'll be in clearwater and a couple other towns um orlando i think and the rig i use on that is a quad cortex and i i go quad cortex uh two of the outputs right to the pa and two of the outputs to a power amp in a speaker cabinet with no speaker simulation on those outs. So I like it. You know, it's very easy for me to use like that. I got my sounds all programmed in for that particular gig for that band and, and it works great. So um, part of, I guess, what I like about it with Fire for Fighting is that what, what happened was because they can do captures, just like you can do in a Kemper profiles, right? But captures, they call them on the quad. Uh, I did captures of the amp that I used to use when I played and toured with Five for Fighting 20 years ago. So I, I have a King Royale, which is kind of like an AC30. And I made captures with the almost exact setting probably that I used to use 20 years ago. Um, and it's just a great sound for that band. So it's the right amp and the right thing for that. You know, it was at least what I used to use and I just got used to hearing... You know, with that particular mix of bass, drums, piano, and sometimes acoustic guitar with the, the voxy kind of sound. And it, it just worked really well. And I, I put that in the quad and it worked good. So these are fly dates. So I can fly out with one guitar, rent a backup, rent an acoustic, rent a speaker cabinet, you know, to run into and just bring a little Seymour Duncan power amp and, uh, and my quad pedal board. Yeah, one guitar suitcase and go do the gig. Yeah. Um, this is a question that I can't really answer, but any opinion on whether a balance tube matters in the phase inverter slot on an amp? I mean, it's supposed to be kind of cool, but I don't know that it really, it's a, probably a question for somebody like Friedman. We should probably do a test someday so that we can just listen and see what we think. Get a really balanced tube and then pop it in and out with the exact same kind that's not balanced in a phase inverter and really listen maybe make a video it sounds like a good video topic it's not something i've ever done a, you know i just rely on what people say you know the tube vendors say it's good to have a balanced phase inverter tube with both sides balanced you know that's two sides to a 12x7 and you know supposedly in the phase inverter good to have them balanced that's what i've heard too but i don't know how much difference does it make how balanced does it need to be Sounds like it's time for a test. One more thing to worry about, right? Reading all your comments here. Let's see. You can use anything you want on a Henley gig, says Entertainment Speculation. Apparently, they're using tracks. Well, I'm going to tell you. No tracks on any of the tours that I did with uh, Mr. Henley and uh, uh, the, uh, and the, the instruments, you know. No tracks on any of that. I was there. That was me playing. God damn it. Um. Let's see what else you guys are talking about here. Entertainment speculation says trem setters rule. Do they still make them? I think so. If that's the name of it, that's what I remember them being calling, but it's just a little thing that you put that the block kicks back against, you know, so that you can just do down with the, the tremolo. I'm not talking about the one that allows you to have a floating bridge, locked bridge, or that's a different thing. Um, there used to be this thing that you could put, and they still make them, I think, but maybe that's what the trem setter is. I don't remember what the thing is called, but if you, you, it's pretty easy to find. I did a simple Google search and looked for like, you know, in an EVH, I wanted to be able to have the trim back up against the, and it just wouldn't work. The bridge was sitting, tilting backwards and stuff. So I got one of these things that you, you screw in, in the trim cavity in the back and it, then the block kicks against it. And, uh, I don't know that it's maybe trim setter isn't trim stop says nerd Halen. Thank you very much. That's what it's called. Trim stop. Yeah. 
Yeah, Tom says the D tuna in my Frankie is really hard to pull out. Maybe that would help. Yes, it will. 100%. Same with me. It's funny. My, mine are, I've got one, my yellow and black one. It, it doesn't have that problem. It, the bridge just goes all the way down to the body and then the fine tuner kicks out back and I can do the D tuna, no problem. But on my Frankie one, it was doing what probably yours is where the bridge was tilting back a bit and then it was hard to get the D tuner out. And it was like, this isn't quite right. And so I bought the uh, trim stop thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else are we talking about here? I'm going to hang for another uh, probably 20 minutes, guys. And then I'm going to jet, I think, because I'm going to start thinking about it's four. The show starts at seven. I'm going to start thinking about getting ready to go find some dinner. And then I'm going to make my way leisurely over to this fun show I get to go see tonight. Uh, speaking of Alex Lyson, Envy of None is working on a new, on new material, says Ray. That's cool. That's the album he put out last year with uh, Andy from uh, uh, management company and stuff. And then he's also involved with him musically. That's cool. Awesome. 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 Stealth Parrot says there are three epic Rush albums to him. 2112 Moving Pictures and Clockwork Angels. I, I mean, um, I, I'll, I'll have to give Clockwork Angels a, another listen since you place it way up there. That's awesome. It's interesting for different people, like they're, they're, uh, when they got into Rush and when, you know, if they, if Rush fans, you know, because they have different um, ideas of what, you know, for some it's Farewell to Kings and for some it's Signals, you know, or, or, you know, maybe for some it's, uh, power windows because they're a little younger. And so for me, the first rush I ever heard was as I was getting into, it, it was kind of signals and uh, grace under pressure. So those albums had a big impact on me. And then of course I went back and listened to, you know, to, and I understand it. moving pictures is probably the greatest, you know, I think uh, it's just incredible all the way through. And such a, God, an album's got such a vibe, like for that, period of that band and then just kind of that's the sound of a band arriving as i've heard some say you know reaching full potential and stuff and then where do they go from there it's interesting but um but i love permanent waves and and i loved because i grew up with it and when i was 14 15 16 years old is when you know that was uh big money you know coming out stuff that sounds so, so futuristic you know uh with uh uh, power windows and stuff. I loved that period of the band too, even though they were getting more into keyboards and that kind of eighties production. It was different signals for me is a amazing record. And I know some people might feel after moving pictures that it wasn't as good or something, but for me it had, I mean, still Terry Brown production and it had, um, such a warm sound to it. The sound of the record is like, you know, um, subdivisions, I don't know, there's a warmth, there's an emotional uh, thing to that record, which maybe with some of Rush's music, um, I don't know. Like when I think about uh, Neil being the lyricist and then Getty interpreting, you know, sometimes, this isn't really a criticism, it's just something that I feel. Like sometimes there was a little bit of that like i don't know some, something on signals i i i like made it a i'm just trying to think this through because i don't want to sound like a criticism of the band but i made a more emotional connection with the like subdivisions maybe it's because of my age and that point where like the lyrical content of being like a kid and trying to fit in and everything that meant a lot to me at that point you know in the video and everything it was like yeah like that was every rush nerd they were kind of writing to their you know like their like that they made an emotional connection there also the song losing it was so amazing to me that was on that record um which is all about you know whatever your talent is and the inevitable decline that you face with age where you just can't do that thing anymore you know be it writing or be it dancing or be it maybe being a musician or whatever the hell it is but i i loved that concept of like even at that age of being like oh that's so heavy like you know the um I don't know. There was just like, it, that's what it is about that record. It's got a mood to it. It's a little dark and yet it's comforting and kind of, uh, so they really struck that balance on that record to me. And maybe that's lost on some people that, 
you know, I don't want to say they couldn't get into it because they were like jaded by what, like whatever, you know, like moving pictures is just incredible, you know, and then permanent waves and signals. And it's just, I don't know, to me, it was a little more human or something and a little less about the technical and the drum fills and stuff like that. It was, a, the, and the Ben Mink violin solo, like probably, you know, not very many guest appearances on Rush albums, but the violin solo on Losing It, it's one of my favorite tracks by them. It's incredible. You just feel the track, you know, it's like, I don't know. I like music that does that, you know, for me. So, you know, that's, that kind of moves you. So, um, yeah, great balance there where, you know, that, they, that they struck. It was really cool. But anyways, um, yeah. Can you recommend a small tube amp that's gigable to get ACDC and Van Halen tones? I mean, if if that if you want to kind of go the rock, I would probably recommend something like the that's not expensive, like the iconic or something from the fifty one fifty. You know, I thought that the clean channel was decent on it when I played. I thought it was pretty darn good. And then you know, the the dirty side, you want Van Halen. I mean, it's kind of that's the you know. I thought it sounded pretty darn good to me. So maybe check that out. Um, anything else I can think of? Like a Friedman runt or something, you could probably find a used runt twenty or or even a uh, that's a small head, you know, that's got two channels and is very gigable. Um, you want to go a little more expensive, you know? Well, you can get into a PT fifteen IR small tube head. Check that out. Uh, you know, Friedman maybe the. Uh, the the Taco Twenty or the the uh, Jakey Lee Twenty something like that. Yep. Okay. Looking through the chat here a little bit more. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Uh, Surf B was at the Hampton, Hampton show. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you for coming to the gig. That show was rocking, dude. I, I had such a good time at that show. It was like a like a like a uh, crazy club, you know? It was awesome. Like a big club. It was killer. I've played there before. I played there with Melissa Etheridge, but I swear we had more people this time. Like for our gig. It was and the town was dead because the weather's bad and it's just the beginning of the season. So it was the first show of the season. Um, for them and uh man like people sure showed up like there was literally nobody in the motels and stuff this is kind of a beach town you know and there was nothing open during the day i was like who's gonna show up for this gig and it was packed loved it i loved it lauren says vi uses synergy but synergy system is pretty great for the small studio with all the options yeah it seems really you know nice for studio voicing you know to be able to grab a few modules you can cover a lot of bases so brian hester says you made a live one good to see you here there's a super chat up there i'm gonna grab that in a minute hampton beach show was great thanks yeah so much fun Rocking guitars in the PA, right? <laughs> How'd the tone sound? Give me your give me your honest opinion. I love the way the guitars are sounding right now in the in the PA. Very happy. Uh, uh, Fred's asking, what was that modeling expensive pedal you were using a while ago? I don't know. Which one? Is it Quad Cortex that you're referring to? Uh, synergy is great in the studio because you can offer clients options that are real without having a wall of heads. Yeah, 100%. I mean, in a small package, it seems to make a lot of sense for that, you know? Do you play vinyl? You know, I've got my whole record collection. I got two turntables that are both broken sitting in my closet. So it's my intention to buy a new little, not crazy expensive, but nice hi fi setup one of these days and get back into it and start buying records and stuff. Um, I visited the Third Man record factory plant in Detroit where they're pressing all the, you know, doing vinyl mastering and making vinyl, cool colored vinyl and everything. It made me want to do like a release. Um, and, you know, I was like, what if I recorded all analog and master it for, you know, have it mastered 
for vinyl and stuff. That'd be fun. Old school, you know? Even if just like an EP or something that I could do like that, it'd be fun. Uh, Graphite and Cigar says that his family has a beach cottage in Hampton Beach. Awesome. That's cool. Uh, Johnny says, I have both amps and now digital IRX rig. I've played both. Just depends on the gig. I prefer amps, but I can play the digital rig too. They're just tools. Yep. That's the way, the way I feel about it. Pretty much verbatim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just pulled my 1987 lead 12, 2550. What's out of storage? Lead 12. Is that a little, uh, the little solid state guy i used to love those they're so cool but yeah you can get it probably fixed it's probably just a couple need to get some parts fixed or changed in it or something and it'll be just bring back to health um uh, you know i'm sure it could sound great again uh does steve i run a synergy into his tube amp or into another system i think steve uses a full synergy preamp power amp like with the axe effects for effects, maybe a few pedals in front. I think that's still his rig, but I'll see tonight. I'll report back next week. Yeah. Uh, what's your power amp and speaker cab, says Karen, with your quad cortex? Uh, I was using a Matrix when I could bring my own power amp. It was Steve Stevens, actually, that he lent me because mine died. and The company's no longer really active. So um, Steve lent me one of his that I still have, and it's a stereo Matrix. Uh and um, then speaker cabs, I would use a couple of 112s from Sir. Uh, one has a V30 in it, and the other one has a Grey Wolf speaker in it. That's a, is it Weber? I hope, I think. Uh, and it just sounded good. I plugged in both those cabs and the blend of the two speakers in stereo, and the, it was like, oh, that's cool. Sounds good. And then when I go fly somewhere, I just rent a Marshall cabinet to just get a little on stage sound. And use a Seymour Duncan power amp. So I can pop it in a backpack. I'm um, just reading uh, all your comments here. Uh, about the Synergy modules around 09, you used your SIG amp with the old Egner. Yep, that's a pretty cool way to use them live, but today seems impractical. Yeah, it was a little crazy. That's why I moved away from it. I mean, I had, I had, you could do this with the Synergy, but I had the Egnator four channel modular thing similar in many ways to the synergy um and i would run the egnator in the loop of an rjm switcher so just make this as simple as possible forgetting everything else if you plugged into the rjm and then into the egnator and how did i have it oh god i see i've already lost the i can't remember how friedman had it patched in but basically it was like this i could use the preamp of my pt100s or I could use the preamp of the Eggnator four channel jobby and then run back to the amp. So I could switch in and out the preamps, you know? I just can't remember the patching, however it was, but it, I was using one of the loops in the RJM somehow. So I could basically have seven different, because the, the, the PT was already three channels, and then I had four different modules in the Eggnator that I could use. So Vox module or Fendery one or a Recto or like whatever. And I could get all these different preamp sounds, but it was too crazy. It was too many volume knobs. That was the main thing that was crazy. You know, three masters for the, the PT channels and then a master on each of the, and, and now that I think about it, the Eggnator modules all, not all of them, but some of them had two channels. <laughs> So I could pick which channel I wanted. So I actually, now that I think about it, I think it was 11 different sounds I could get, you know, when you count the dual modules and different gain and master voicings. And some of them had dual EQs and stuff. It was like, this is insane. And so just balancing the volumes every day, I'd go to a sound, it'd be a little quieter than one of the other channels. I'd have to go back and go, which preamp is that? Oh, it's this one. Turn the master up a hair. And it was like, this is insanity. It's way, way too much. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with... Uh, with uh, with what I'm doing now, you know, just three channels is enough to worry about. Oh yeah, 
I forgot about this. I'd be curious to hear Satch's new third power amps. He's using the T75 speakers. It was a little odd for the Van Halen stuff. I believe Eddie did use them on a few occasions, but was more of a greenback guy. That's correct. He used evidently 75s with Saldano, though. So for around the around the uh, a Carnal Knowledge album, he used 75s. He liked the sound of a cabinet that he rented, I think, from, I think it was like an Andy Brower cabinet. Um, Dave Friedman tells this story. So he rented that, and then he ended up using that cabinet for a lot of that record, and it sounded good with the Soldano. So maybe it's got something to do with that. Uh, not my favorite speaker either, but, you know, the way an amp pairs with a speaker is, can be a thing, you know? And I'm not always playing, you know, that Soldano sound or whatever. So maybe it was great. You know, the, the guitar sound on that record is killer, so... Yeah. Will you be out again with five for fighting this summer? I will. Yeah, a little bit. We're going to do two weeks in August, I think. And then, like I say, in May, I've got a few Florida dates. It's not a lot. It's a couple weeks, you know, total or two and a half weeks if you count May and August together. But uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. How was it being around Blues Saracino? Uh, Blues is great. He's a sweet dude. He'll, you know, talk your ear off about guitar and amps, and he's just a great dude, great career, and um, he loves all this stuff, you know, uh, uh, marshals and pickups, and, you know, he's, he's like, he's become a friend. He's a super cool guy, so. Oh, there's John. Didn't see you were here, John. John says, if you pop a fuse, put in a new fuse, the next fuse might not blow. Tubes can arc but not stay blown or shorted. I wouldn't trust a tube, but it's not always easy to find the bad one. Hi, John. Good to see you, friend. Um, yeah, I guess I got lucky because, like, when I put the fuse, so I'd blown an HT fuse, went and got some more, put the new HT fuse in the amp. Um, this is this amp that I had a fuse problem with recently for those that are just joining put the new HT fuse in the amp I powered it up had it out of the chassis was measuring voltages on the tubes and stuff and then I heard the fuse you know and then I was like oh all reading zero now pulled out the second fuse you know and it had popped so I thought okay well let's start experimenting with pulling tubes so I pulled the tube the outer pair put another fuse in powered it up Oh, and, and I got two replacement tubes that were a match for, you know, that, so I knew that they'd be right around the same. And I popped them in, powered it up, amp didn't blow again. Fuse didn't blow again. HT fuse didn't blow. Ran it for a while. HT fuse didn't blow. I was like, maybe I got lucky. Maybe I found the, it's one of the two tubes, one of the, one of the outer pair. One of those tubes was bad. Uh, and yeah, then long story short, I just, you know, whatever biased, Left it running for a few hours, no problems. It's been good ever since. So I think I, I think I uh, successfully found the the culprit that way. Uh, good to see you here, John. Uh, what else we got here? Um, I like the semi hollow guitars Alex played, including Howard Roberts. Yeah, the Howard Roberts. I'd love to ask him about that. Like, why the Howard Roberts? How did you? How did he get it? How did that come about? You know, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, looking through the chat, Tom says signals uh, spoke to the high school me. Hundred percent. Yeah, me too. Because I was right at that age. You know, I mean, it was outright when I was basically junior high analog kid that's great i love how you had analog kid and digital man on the same album too i always like that <laughs> yeah uh yeah 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 see i like getty's voice arthur says that he doesn't like getty's voice but getty's voice when he's saying I don't know. I loved that album too when he's not always like singing super high, but I like that stuff. I, it's a, it's an acquired taste, I guess, but I liked his voice and because um, he sounded like him, you know, it's like Dylan or John Lennon. They had unique voices. And um, on on Signals, it was, I, I liked the way the lyrics and his voice melded and I believed it, you know, it was like it, he was singing about stuff that was relatable. And so just for me, it was like, 
and it, and like listen to losing it it's not it's really pretty like his voice on that actually it's a great uh it's in a lower range and it's just this killer track you know with this beautiful violin on it it's it's really unique uh there's peter uh what's up man thanks for the super chat enjoyed this week's videos so videos this week well I've, i'll put up this one for this donner prince overdrive i need to edit it and get it out this week so i will do that uh and i'm not sure what else but at least that one for sure thank you for the super chat appreciate that still want to hear your take on the solo from chemistry that's another cool one yeah i'll, I'll have to go and give that another another listen so that i can turtleize it again uh thank you for the super chat though and I, I'll, I'll give it a listen i love i like that we're geeking out on rush this week can you suggest an ES-335 clone for a guy on a budget? You know, I would probably look for something from Ibanez from maybe the 80s. Like those, like Schofield, didn't he use? They were really cool. I remember I had a roommate with one that was really nice. See if you can find a, see if you can find one of those. They were really good guitars, I thought. They kind of, they kind of vibey too. They're kind of cool. Those early 80s ones. I don't remember what the hell they were called, but they were, you know, like a flame top kind of tobacco sunburst uh, situation. You know, and as far as something new, I mean, maybe look for something from newish from Epiphone or something. They're making pretty darn good guitars these days, I think. Uh, you've been weary of Epiphone. Well, if you find a good one, I mean, you know, you should always play it. But if you find a good one that speaks to you, it's cool. Do you use baritone guitars very often? I wouldn't say very often, but I have one, and I love it. When I do play it, it's fun. You've probably seen it. It's a Dan Electro. It's not an expensive guitar, but I love that thing. It's got tremolo on it and stuff. It's super cool. Yeah. Thoughts on the Fender Tone Master Pro? Um, well, I did a video for it. I think there's some really neat features about it, not the least of which is the... Um, ability to use like vintage fuzzes and stuff with it because of the the analog loops in the front that before you hit a buffer so it's one of the only devices like that that'll let you incorporate something like a fuzz face or a treble boost and get the real you know that's useful um and i think that there's some really nice things about it i think that there's some up like as it gets updated there's probably going to be some cool you know some cool updates and stuff that bring it because there's a few things about it where you know it's their first sort of for foray into that world so Without saying much more about it, I just wait and see what they're going to do with it and, and where it goes, you know. Uh, one thing I liked was using external impulse responses with it. So I would recommend that. If you get one, try using like, much like I feel like about a lot of them, you get some like Celestian IRs or something and throw them in there. And I thought that that was a nice sort of, uh, you know, upgrade to the voicings and stuff. Uh and the speaker cabs go to the lower level of house of guitars holy vinyl okay i'll go check it out i will tomorrow you've talked me into it uh i want to know about vise rig as well okay well i'll check it out tonight and see i've got a pretty good seat so it should be relatively close i think uh what else have we got here Thoughts on a full range flat response cab versus power amp and speaker cab. Uh, I don't really love the full range flat response cabs, although I get them and sure in a pinch and, you know, could probably get used to it and probably end up enjoying it. But I think you're trying to recreate something that is physically very difficult to do, which is the, you know, sound and feel of a 412 or whatever, like flapping your pant legs. And it's got a certain sound and response. I mean, like I said, I have not been playing quiet these days. <laughs> and when we do, like we do jump, for instance, in the set, it's just fun. It's at the end of the set, just kind of fun, fun for the whole family rock track that everybody can get into. Um, but when I play uh, like Eddie would, I just play, you know, muted chunky chords in the verse, right? And C to F to G, right? You know, and, and it's kind of loud behind me. And I've got like the, I've actually got harmonizer going on it and stuff for a full kind of 80s Van Halen effect. And when I play, when I lean into that, like, that sounds like the stage is just chug, 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 <laughs> Like when I'm on that particular sound, cause I'm kind of loud on that song. I just use one sound. I thought for that song, I'd just be like Eddie, 
one loud guitar sound, roll the volume up and down. So solo, you know, the whole nine yards all on the volume pot. Like I don't change sounds or get louder for the solo. It's just one guitar sound. Uh, and um, so it's a little louder than some of the rest of the set that I'm playing. And when I play those muted eighth notes with that tone, it's like there ain't nothing like two four twelves behind you doing that. The whole stage is kind of pumping, you know. <laughs> And that's the thing that you're trying to recreate with an FRFR cab. That to me, to me, they sound like monitors. You know, it's even with a good monitor, and I have some guitar coming out of my monitor, but I don't like to hear my whole sound down in front of me coming out of a wedge. It always sounds a little hi-fi and a little fizzy and a little just not exactly like what I like, like what I'm used to, like a green back behind me in a cabinet. You know, so I'm more of a fan of the speaker cab. Um, I, I don't mind at all, even like the Pfeiffer fighting rig I was talking about, the Quad Cortex, I don't mind at all using a couple of Sur 112s behind me and a power amp with no mics on the cabinets. They're just for me, for a little feel and feedback on stage. I don't play loud in that band. You know, it's just a little guitar behind me that sounds good. It's a very, it's a quieter dynamic show. <laughs> and um, and then I run RIRs to the front of house. That sounds great to me. It's more for just me and my comfort on stage, you know. So... Um, anyways, yeah, I'm still, I'm still just a fan of guitar cabs. So, uh, let's see. This is interesting. Uh, Mark says he's got a T75 cab from 86 and one from 04. The 86 is way better. I wonder if it's just the speakers or, if, or, uh, like if they're actually different or if it's break in or what, you know? But yeah, I can believe, I mean, there's been a lot of tests online of speakers, you know, that like a million V30s and they all sound radically different. It's like, who knows? It's, it's, it seems uh, from users' tests and kind of, you know, um, my own experience and everything, it's kind of a moving target, speakers, you know? It seems like they don't all, they're not, like even Celestians are not all created equal for whatever reason. So when you find a cab you like, probably good to hold on to it. I don't know, like... Like you watch some of these videos, like how can so many V30s sound so different, you know? But they do from different eras. So it's interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, looking through your your comments and stuff here. I'm gonna split. Oh, I should go, you guys, because I gotta get I gotta get ready to get out of here pretty quick. So another five minutes, and I'll split. I'll go till uh, four forty-five my time here. Uh, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, any chance of getting Paul Stanley on the show after the tour? I don't know. I, I've spoken a little with Paul and he was very, very nice. I don't know if he would do my kind of show or not. You know, I have no idea, but I'd love to chat with him. Actually, he's a really cool guy. He was, he strikes me as a great dude, actually. Uh, yeah. That's some very, uh, radical uh varying opinions about getty's voice in the chat i love it i don't know come on some people like eccentric voices like richard thompson tom waits dylan i like it yeah i like character i like to know who it is when they're singing you know and it doesn't have to be technically perfect it just you know i don't know we always geek out on rush i guess we do it's a lot of russian van halen around here but if you like that, then good. Uh, let's see. What else are you guys talking about? Ibanez 2630 for an Ibanez on a budget. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So looking through the chat, somebody's recommending the Epiphone Alex Life's and Les Paul. The 1980 Schofield model was an AS300. Yeah, yeah. They've gotten kind of pricey. An affordable option could be a Sire Larry Carlton model for under 1000 I saw Larry play that guitar, actually, at the the uh, uh, last year at the, the Baked Potato. It was cool. I like that that guy, you know, it's like it's a tool to him, you know. It's like he can play guitar and make music on, you know, on it just fine. And he's probably just fine with it, you know. Andy says, uh, come on now, Getty Lee, Bon Scott, Robert Plant, these are the voices and vocals of amazing classic rock. Agreed, yeah. It's like, it's all character, you know. I mean, what I love about Rush is that, 
it's, it's sort of similar to Billy Corgan. It's not like he has a classically great singing voice, you know, but he sure made it work, you know, and it's probably an acquired taste, but big band, very popular. So it worked, you know, and he could have shied away from that, you know, like and found a singer or something, but he just did it. And it's, um, uh, there's something to be said for that. And I really respect it, you know, making it work, doing the, doing what you can with the instrument that you've got. And, uh, pretty cool. Yep. 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 Uh, all right. I'm, I'm headed down to the bottom of the chat here really quick. Um, somebody says, enjoy New York city. I'm not actually in the city. I'm in Rochester, <laughs> but I'm still in New York. And, uh, I did go to the city for a couple of days last week and it was awesome. I had so much fun. It was really great. I, I love that place still, you know, I had a really good time there. I spent a couple of days there and it was good to get there and, and have a nice, I need to do a little more of that. Um, like when I go there and make sure I spend some good time doing the things I like to do and it feels good just from a, I don't know. There's still a lot about that city that I, that I love. And there's areas that I love to go to. And there's a lot of the places that are really similar to when I started going there. First, my first time in New York city was the mid nineties. And it, of course it's changed a lot since then, but there's some things that happen, you know, I find that I, I still go there and it feels really similar and there's just an energy I like there. Uh, that's, that's not dissimilar to things that I still like about LA. You know, there's feels like there's a lot happening. It's a lot going on. And like there's a lot of possibility and uh there's just a you know i like that so anyways all right everybody this was fun and next week i'll be home um let me see what's going on next week uh oh uh john sent me a text basically just talking about tubes so just saying sometimes it's not easy to find the bad one Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, that's what I say. I think I got lucky when I found the bad one. You know, it's not always like going to happen, but I think it, it seems like the, the amp is okay now. So uh, I, one of the biggest things with guitars and amps is drag is when it's an intermittent problem, just like your car. You take it to the dealer and you want to get it fixed and it's normally got a rattle or something ticking or something. And then you take it there and it's not doing it. You try and show the dealer and they're like, sorry, I don't know, you know. And with amps, it's like, yeah, I guess blow a fuse. You could put another one in and it'll work. It's like, why did I blow the fuse, you know? So it was cool for me in a way to blow two in a row, you know, and uh, and then start troubleshooting and then not have a fuse blow. It's like, I think probably we're good. Knock on wood. Two bands, part of the deal. Okay, everybody, um, I'm going to split. Uh, I was just going to say next week I'm, where am I? When do I go home? Let's see. Uh, no. Um, let's double check in here. Yeah, I will be home by Friday. So that means I'll be in my own studio next Sunday, doing Sunday Live. Back at the uh, Thorn World headquarters. Everybody say bye to Toby. Just look at him. Can't wait to see that guy next week. There's a last minute super chat. Thank you. Uh, who's that from? That's from Paul. Joining conversation. Looking forward to seeing you at CRS in Morristown. That'll be the last night of the tour. New Jersey. That's as close as we get to the city. So anybody that's in New York City, come on out and see us out there. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys uh, that, uh, that I'm not going to see at a show this week. I'll see you next Sunday. For more Sunday Live good times, as always, appreciate you all. Be nice to one another. Have a terrific week. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.